Well, hello there, everybody. Welcome to another Wine Shark Wednesday. It's me, your host, the Wine Shark. Good to see everybody on this, you know, now dark at six o'clock fall evening. Uh, kind of a thing we're still getting used to, the whole fallback thing. So anyway, I hope everybody's having a good week. I know I have uh, feel a little off there, but hey, feeling a little better today. That's nice. But uh, I want to say, hey, so there's Dave and Mary. They said they got more snow up in Minnesota. Well, hooray for fall time snow. I'm, I admit, I'm a tad jealous. It's been fluctuating cool and warm fall back to Indian summer here, so as it is. But anyway, uh, so yeah, so what's been going on in our last week? Um, we've got, a sh I want to say hey, so I want to say a big thank you. Today's Veterans Day, so I hope everybody's given a moment to think about all those that have served our country and fallen in all of their capacities. So therefore, you know, 11th of November is always kind of cool. World War One and the end of that whole business and everything that's happened since. So hope everybody takes a minute and raises a glass to a fallen dead. Anyway, um, Saturday, we've got a live show down at Reunion Tower. Very excited about this. Um, although we are being COVID compliant and dealing with social distancing and all the other safety factors, we'll at least get to stand up in front of some people and chat. I get to actually do a show where I can hear you guys in response to my jokes. And that's not for nothing, let me tell you. So anyway, um, you, know, although you guys could be just as quiet as you are right now where I can't hear you. It may not be any better. Anyway, um, so that's kind of cool. We did wine and cheese last week, and I got a lot of questions about cheese. And so in between here, there, and everywhere, and so I decided to kind of repackage, no pun intended, this cheese and talk about some, drop you guys some cheese knowledge today. Um, for those of you who have seen the cheese shows, some of this will be redundant, but many of you have not. So this is going to be kind of a cool deep dive into, into uh, wine's fermentation partner in so we always like that. It's always kind of fun. Um, you know, people talk about wine and cheese as almost, you know, like peanut butter and jelly. It so it comes around so very often. So it'd be kind of, we're going to talk about that here in just a few. But uh, anyway, I hope everyone is doing well and has come back to uh, back to the, the show with feeling that they are ready for yet another glass. So anyway, let's get uh, talking. Oh, yeah, and then we're going to do with the Firefly Ridge on the grocery store grab. We'll get to that in about halfway through the show. So let's talk about cheese. Let's talk about cheese. Let's talk about wine's fermentation partner in crime. Um, the, as I said, it's they're, they're kind of a, 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 almost a, an iconic duo when it comes to food pairing with cheese. Or with wine, rather. Um, but one could easily say the other thing goes goes around as well. For food pairings with cheese are something that's just as common. Uh, there are 500 plus types of cheese worldwide from almost every country that uses milk producing animals of one sort or another. Uh, there's uh, a lot to be said for this deep and ancient topic. In as much as the same way I talk about wine, where we're talking about thousands of different varietals and hundreds of commercially popular or viable versions thereof, there are just as much to explore in the world of cheese. So it's a fascinating topic as far as I'm concerned when it comes to how it, how it works with wine and learning at a bigger level more than just, oh, I like cheese and thinking about what you buy at the grocery store. Uh, so there are four primary milks uh, that that uh, cheeses come from, uh, cows, goats, sheeps, and buffalo, though there are milks made from other more exotic animals as well, like reindeers and moose, etc. Uh, but the four primary ones that you're going to see most widespread as far as circulation in your grocery stores and your usual cheesemonger shops are going to be made from those front primary four milks, okay? Uh, the, we're going to touch, I'm going to touch a little bit more on milk again here in a minute, but I want to talk just at first about what we mean when we talk about cheese. There are, just like in the world of wine, where you have different grades of quality, you have a very similar thing in the world of cheese, in that uh, you've got your basic kind of mass-produced cheese-like objects. Uh, a lot of what Americans are used to when we kind of think of the concept of cheese is a industrial-scale product that has very little in resemblance to its original roots and uh, unfortunately that is uh, you know until you get get exposed to quality cheeses can be what people perceive of when we say the word uh, in the same way that you know 
buying a five dollar bottle of wine or two buck chuck makes people think that hey this is wine too well yeah technically but uh the next kind of step up from that i think that we're going to be much more common in the last oh i guess i'd say 20 years maybe is the idea of bulk produced but worldwide styles of cheese actually getting into popularizing more imitation artisan cheese, if you will, or large produced artisan cheeses. Uh, I separate this from the concept of, of handcrafted artisanal cheese simply by the level of availability we're talking about here. Um, it has to scale up at something. And so you can find a couple of cheese producing companies that are now fairly large creameries and make, make really good products, but that are widely distributed uh, more than just say in their local shop. There's a difference between the local small dairy that only produces and sells so much because they've only got say, you know, 100 cows to some of these larger operations that are able to produce uh, stuff that they can get all over the country. Um, things like Bellavantano and uh, Cowgirl Creamery and uh, what to say, um, excuse me, Humboldt Fog, Cypress Grove, uh, things like that. These are names for these are very high quality award winning cheesemakers, but are at a they're a, certainly a level above the mass produced product, but they're not quite what I would call the small shop either. Uh, and then at the top of the pyramid, you have these little tiny artisanal guys that do very exclusive small run stuff that just because they, they've, they either they've never grown or they're, they're, they're highly niche and their product isn't widely available. Those are things that are delightful to try, but difficult to get a hold of. It's very similar in the wine world to when we talk about things like, you know, boutique wine club only winemakers. They produce, you know, thousand cases a year and that's it. Right. And so that's, they're, they're awesome and they can be amazing finds, but there's, you have to, finding them in itself and getting access to them is no mean feat, right? It's not like I can, I can recommend you a store in your local area that you can go pick one of these up. And so in the same way that wine has got that pyramid, cheese has something very similar, which I think is, is again, the parallels here that I have found over the years of study of this, you know, only keep growing when it comes to things like that. So uh, it's, it's something to, to take into account in that you're going to find that the more you search for something special and unique, the cooler stuff you're going to find, but occasionally you'll find yourself put in the position of, man, I really wish that, you know, I had more information or more accessibility rather to, uh, to grab one of these, one of these cheeses and share it with friends. So, uh, in the EU, especially a lot of these artisanal style, style cheeses are actually protected in the same way that wine is. Uh, what I mean by that is when we talk about things like the, uh, AOP or AOC designations, the Appellation de Origin Contrôlée or Appellation de Origin uh, Protégée. These are protected areas of designation that say this type of cheese is only made here using these particular techniques, uh, these particular cows, particular sheep, these particular goats, etc. Um, it's really kind of interesting. They have a three-tier system that in the way that the EU did a lot of stuff to homogenize stuff between uh, different countries in its, in its member nations, they did a lot to, to, and I hate to use the word homogenize in an artisanal cheese sense because that sounds ironic, but, but they did. They kind of cleaned up the nomenclature across several countries in order to make things un, e more easily understandable to especially non-EU non people, meaning countries we're targeting to sell this stuff to. So uh, they, there's three levels there. They have traditional specialties guaranteed, which is the lowest level of the pyramid, the broadest. So this is similar to uh, what kind of, like wine of the country or VDP level um, in the you know, which is the uh, lowest tier of the of the of this system for wine, and that just means that these that they they have they they have some specialties guaranteed in the styles, but they're not necessarily following the strict uh, a strict guideline as it regards to say things like aging, milking regimens, things like that. Next tier up from that is protected geographical origin or PGI or indication. Sorry, uh, not origin. PGI or protected geographical indication is similar to the IGT in wine, indication of geographic type, right? 
uh, Indicazione Geographica Tipica is the Italian version of that. But IGP or IGT is that middle layer, okay? So those are usually a little bit more regional because they have a geographic, or they have to be, because they have a geographic origin. It means they're only produced in this area. Then there's a higher tier than that, a more specific tier, which is protected designation of origin, or PDO. Now that not only says it has to have a geographic location, but they also tend to add in things like milking regimens, very specific levels of aging, methods of production, how the cheese, for instance, the size and shape of the cheese is very important to some of these things. You can only produce wheels that have that weigh about that weigh between X and Y, and they're about this big. And so, in other words, there's this there's this standardization that goes throughout this. That is, this is what this cheese means. So these are really cool to find, and many of them are the names that we associate with the fine quality cheeses that we're talking about. So when we say things like Appenzeller or uh, we're talking about um, uh, you know, Mimolet or things like that, these are all, they're produced in very specific ways. And that's kind of a, seeking out that level of cheese is very similar to seeking out that level of wine. When you get that you have that guarantee of flavor and taste and experience and you get to travel around with your with your taste buds and if you're doing things in the fun fun fashion it's great to experience the cheeses of a region with the wines of the same type now it's one of the things i haven't done on the cheese show yet is i haven't done a strict uh regional regional matchup it is in the plan uh, and we will work on that but that's one of those things that if you really want to i've always said this about food pairing with wine in general you really want to hit it out of the park, have the same cuisine with the wine from the area. Have the, you know, or, or if you've got wine from the area, look up the, the, the recipes and cuisine styles in that area, and you're guaranteed to find that they're going to be a, a beautiful, beautiful match. Okay. So uh, then let's, let's talk a little bit more about milk, because that's the, the, there's, the interesting thing about cheese is that it's actually a really simple thing. It, it, I believe it, it, it's this combination of salt, milk, it's actually the proteins from the milk, the, the uh, rennet, and starter bacteria. So rennet is the enzyme that separates the milk from the curds, the solids, from the liquids, the whey. Okay, so you have your milk, you add your rennet, you put your, your starter bacteria, and you put salt. And that's pretty much what cheese is, no matter what type of milk or even where it's from. So its starting component is very similar to wine. It's grapes possibly with some additional bacteria, though some places they don't, and some places, some cheeses don't either. But that's basically it. It's grapes, set them, ferment them. You may squeeze them differently or process them differently, but at its heart, that's all wine is. Well, cheese is pretty simple as well. And these, these little variations in what you do along the way is what creates the excellent variety that we've been talking about. It's 500 different types. So... Milks, as I said before, the four primary kinds, sheep, goats, goats uh, cows, and water buffalo. Um, like I said, those are mostly because those are domesticated animals. But there's also domesticated, that's why it's water buffalo when I say buffalo. There's actually dom domesticated other buffalo, there meaning American style, there's camels, there's donkeys, there's mares, so you can make horse cheese. Moose, reindeer, and yak all, you know, on the list when it comes to making. Because if they, those have all got milk, you can make cheese from that. But uh, the why is the milk selection so important? Well, cheese is, a, is you know, a, a, by just like wine, a definitive agricultural product. It tastes like what you put into it in the same way that grapes and make wine. And in other words, where it's from and what, what it grows on is what changes the way things taste. Same thing applies for milks with for the milks uh, for cows, sheep, goats, and water buffalo. So the what you get there is unique to what they eat, and the the actual chemical properties of the type of milk of these various animals. Okay, so there's variations in the pH uh, for for different types of of milk. There's variations in the amount of water to fat content. Uh, then there's also a difference in the amount of lactose, the actual lactic lactose that goes into this. So uh, each one of those has different uh, elements and properties that change the way their cheeses taste in the end. Um, also understand that pasteurization, the choice to use this or not, is also one of the things that is controlled by certain, by those cheese controls, but is a 
a strong choice. Uh, for, for instance, in America, we are not allowed to have unpasteurized cow's milk cheeses that are under, I think, six months in age or something like that. So you can't get fresh cow mozzarella here. It's just a thing. The FDA says, we're tired of you getting sick. But, um, oh, sorry, sorry, my notes here say 60 days, not... So 60 days is the minimum level for U.S. pasteurization uh, for things like that. But many artisanal cheeses use unpasteurized milk on purpose because, again, those bacteria that, uh, that are in there are part of the, the creation process and they become part of the flavor. Uh, to use a similar analogy in wine, because, again, cheese and wine have so, much thing, so many things in common, you can look at uh, filtration and fining of wine. Uh, fining is the chemical filtration of, of wine usually using gelatin or another media uh, then there's uh, then there's just a simple filtration of the wine using various uh, grades of very very uh, fine filters some wineries don't do those things because they believe that in the process of taking those particular solid matter out of your wine you're also stealing some of the flavor same same when it comes to pasteurization um, so the other cool thing about milks is they have uh, is it has a seasonal effect. Um, truly artisanal cheeses, not mass-produced cheeses, are really only available or change the way they are based on what time of year it is. Uh, the lactation cycles of the animals, uh, which vary from anywhere from 240 days for sheep to 305 days a year for cow, determines when you can you know, market. Now, modern farming has allowed 365-day farming um, using staggered calving, and so modern methods can change that up a lot, but the old, but the good old fashioned ways, they don't do that. They don't, they don't use that, that system to disrupt it. They basically go with the traditional flow of seasonality. Uh, and that's very cool because, and very important, because if you're naturally feeding your animals on fodder that is part of nature, the grass and pasture feeding that they use is gonna change the way that milk tastes. As we said before, it has a very distinct flavor. Grazing during summer or spring is very different than grazing during the fall. So off season, they're, they're generally being fed hay and dry grains, which again, changes the flavor of the cheese. So um, that's the other thing is because when, wild, when you're wild pasturing your animals, you also get a lot of variation in flavor based on what their fodder looks like. Whereas if they're, if they're barn raised and barn fed, you generally use homogenous feeding methods, which homogenizes the flavor, not meaning the homogenized milk, which is different. So anyway, um, single herd or, fa or, or farmstead cheese making is like the ultimate pinnacle of that, of that artisanal pyramid. This is where we talk about the same idea happens in wine. We're talking about a single vineyard. Well, imagine a cheese where it's only made from, these, from this group flock of sheep in that guy's field or this village's field in this one area of these mountains. How cool is that? I mean, it's very much a taste the land kind of experience, just like the world of wine. So anyway, that's, uh, that's kind of the milk thing. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about before we get to the middle of the show, though, is just uh, we'll talk about aging real quick, and then we're going to talk about care and feeding of your cheese. So um, aging or maturation of cheese, getting it up to be its cheese level component, uh, actually has what call, it's called affinage, um, from the French word affiner, or to refine is the getting older of cheese in a controlled way. Be interested to know that many artisanal cheesemakers, the person who's a cheesemaker is actually a separate job from the affinois, the person who actually ages it. So the farmer and the person who milks the cows is the cheesemaker, and then he takes that off, and once he's got it to a certain point, hands it off to an affinois, sells it to them, they then age the cheese for a certain period of time, and then they sell the cheese. Um, so an affineur, uh, is the age, sorry, not affinoir, affineur, is the ager of cheese and also the name of the cave where the cheeses might be aged, depending on what your context is. Um, it's a separate skill from cheese making um, because what they do is their job is mostly monitoring the humidity, temperature, hygiene of the cheese, and the and tasting it along the way to make sure the aging process is going correctly. Is having that palate to know. A lot of testing is involved. This Again, the parallel to wine, it's very similar to the process of getting that wine after fermentation during the blending, racking, and aging process of wines, where you're taking different barrels, you're tasting them, you're coming up with a final blend about what it's going to be and which one of these things you're choosing, how to dial those things in as a winemaker. That's really what the affineur is doing 
in the cheese making process. So enzymes and microbes that kind of go along in that cheese making process react inside the cheese and break down the milk fats and proteins into amino acids and fatty acids. This fancy chemical fun, fun time is very similar to what happens in, again, the wine world. Once you get that stuff fermented and you're putting it in the in, in the barrel during the aging process, what you're or or if, if you're or if you're bottle conditioning with something like say champagne, what you're doing is you're you're going through this process of breaking down polyphenolic chains, linking them up together, uh, you know, letting certain uh, gas compounds escape from the process while others are created. There's a whole dynamic biocycle that's going on inside there that is making the wine what it is. Same thing that happens in cheese. Um, all those chemical, physical, and microbiological changes. For instance, calcium lactate crystals and uh, tyrosine crystals start to form. If you've ever had a good, like, aged cheddar or Parmesan cheese, you might notice that there's almost this kind of crunchy crystalline nature that almost tastes like you're biting into a salt crystal crystal. Those are examples of lactate crystals and tyrosines, um, a very pleasurable textural component that adds flavor bomb to all these aged cheeses. And that's part of that affineur process, okay? So the other thing to remember though is more is not always better to draw the parallel with wine. You don't, leave, you know, just because you decide to age your wine for 12 months in oak versus 24 months in oak doesn't mean the 24 months in oak is 2X better than the 12 month age. Everything to its right purpose. Every every wine has its has its correct amount of aging. The same thing happens with cheese. Just because it's older doesn't make it better. In fact, you what a great thing to do is to try uh, a cheese vertical, to try certain types of cheeses that age or, and are age up to several levels. Parmigiano Reggiano is a perfect example. Parmigiano Reggiano is perfect to try at a three, five, seven, nine year and see the differences in those cheese. Um, same thing though, you've got to be able to do it from the same cheese producer. You can't just choose random cheeses because their animals might have eaten different and the cheeses will present in different ways. Um, that, by the way, being the other thing, all Parmesano Reggiano, for instance, is not created equal. All cheeses are not the same cheese. All all Emmentalers are not the same Emmentaler. They're being from different areas or different producers. It's going to change the way the cheese tastes. We can classify them in broad scale in the same way we do with wine. Merlot or pure Merlot wines taste something like this, but Merlot from this person versus that person might taste very different depending on their wine making techniques. Same thing happens with cheese. So, um, but there are two broad ways that we talk about how cheese breaks up and breaks down or ages, if you will, um, internal and then surface ripening. So internal ripening cheeses is, I'm oh, sorry, let's start with surface, go from the outside in. Surface ripening adds compounds to the exterior of the cheese. They put stuff on the cheese to encourage the growth of bacteria and that causes the reactions to start happening to make the cheese awesome and wonderful. So this is things like washed rind cheeses, where they wash them with salt or wine or spices, and this chemical compound, this chemical, they're, 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 whatever their particular brand of goo is that they spread on there, uh, and they when they dunk these cheeses in brine or various things, they're, what they're doing is they're chemically activating the outside of that cheese that then cascades as a process through the whole thing to firm it up, like letting a flan set. Uh, interior ripening is the reverse, where you wax the cheese or you remove oxygen from the process from the outside, and the product process begins spontaneously on the inside. So you get totally soft cheeses with no big thick rinds um, are very different from that. I'm um, looking at you with things like, uh, um, I want to say no, no, I poise and it's a bloom rind. Um, I want to say... Oh crap! I think of a good a good example of one of these. It's an internal, an internal only. Um, I'll think of one in a minute. But anyway, uh, that exact opposite process is something that brings things. Also, many modern cheating processes do the same thing. They do it sans oxygen and sans aging. So, last and finally, I want to tell you the say that you've been treating your cheese wrong, and your cheese has something to say. So that idea is as simple as. If you are eating your cheese directly out of the refrigerator, you're doing your cheese no service. Uh, we tend to store our cheeses in the refrigerator, refrigerated sections to preserve their longevity. Remember, because they're aging, they don't last forever. Uh, they do ripen, and they get to they get to just the right stage. 
So when you get to that, uh, you want to, when you, when you store your cheese, that's awesome by storing it in the refrigerator, but you don't want to just cut it and put it on a plate and eat it, or even just cut it and eat it like sometimes I might be doing. Uh, the reason is, is because that temperature affects flavor just the same way it does with wine, right? We've talked about having your red wines too warm and your white wines too cold. Same thing applies to cheese. There's a right, there's a correct range to, because especially what you're getting is aromas, just like wine, and textures a little bit more than wine. The textural component that it comes down to it with wine is a whole thing. I'm uh, sorry, with cheese, the whole thing. So number one, let your cheese breathe. So presentation and service, right? Um, you want cheese paper for long-term storage rather than plastic. Interestingly enough, you go to a high quality cheese store and you ask for something, they're gonna do two things that you'll notice right off the bat, is that they're gonna purchase, you're gonna purchase right off the wheel or block of cheese. It's not gonna be pre-cut and wrapped in cellophane. Now, with big, busy grocery stores and whatnot, that tends to be the norm, but the best flavor of your cheese comes when it's cut fresh off the block, because you're minimizing that. And then you don't store it in plastic because plastics actually impart their own little subtle bits of flavor. You wrap it in a type of paper called cheese paper. It's a lightly waxed paper that still lets the cheese get air uh, in, a, in a proper fashion without drying it out. So that is a huge deal, right? That, that And by the way, when we're talking about paying anywhere from, well, I'd say 15 to $25 a pound for high quality cheeses, it's worth a little bit of investment in wrapping it correctly. So the other thing to do is to face your cheese. And I don't mean look at your cheese and say, hey cheese, we need to have a talk. I mean, you do you basically slice off a very thin layer of the outside of the cheese and then you don't serve that piece. Um, it might seem a little bit wasteful, but what you're doing is usually, by the way, that's the host's slice is what I call it, is you take that little slice and you cut the top, of the, and again, as thin as you can. And what you're doing is you're taking away that air exposed portion that's already kind of stale, if you will. So if you've had cheese that's been out on its own for a while, that's something to do um, in preparation for service. Um, most of us don't really do that. You know, we tend to just kind of cut right in. But if you've noticed a piece of cheese that doesn't quite taste right, you'll notice that the middle of the cheese tastes better. It's kind of like the, the edge brownie problem. So, uh, and then the other question is, well, so how long does my cheese right last? We talked about how it ripens even after you purchased it. It has a, it has a go to date, especially if these are uh, younger or active cheeses. So, fresh, no rind cheeses like uh, Chev and mozzarella, things like that, uh, five to seven days. And generally, you don't face those because there's nothing to face on them. They're basically a solid blob of the same product. Uh, bloomy rind cheeses like Brie. Uh, they can ripen up to five to 10 days. So you don't necessarily, you know, you keep them refrigerator stable, but you know, you don't want ones that last really a really long time. Uh, washed rind cheeses, you know, things with that orange exterior that we think about on, on anything from, uh, from anything from, from cheddar styles all the way through, uh, things like, uh, uh, what would I say, Appenzeller or, or uh, Gouda, things like that, Habla. Um, those are seven to 14 days, about so a week to two weeks they'll last. Again, that exterior protects them. Uh, Semi-soft to firm cheeses, uh, they, these are two to three weeks in your fridge. Okay, they've got a much longer lifespan, but you want to face them before serving as they start, as I said, they start to grow stale on the outward facing part. Hard or dry cheeses like Parmesan Reggiano and things like that, um, they can last up to a month. Uh, in your for in your fridge, but again, face them before serving them to your guests. Um, and then, last but not least, a, a style not mentioned there is blue cheese. Blue cheese really depends on the moisture. Um, soft, creamy cheeses like Gorgonzola Dolce uh, last maybe five to ten days, but drier, fudgier, stronger ones like Stilton can last a couple of weeks. So really, that's remember blue is a whole class of cheeses, not one type of cheese. There's a lot of styles of cheese that are blue. So we'll go into a whole blue cheese thing. I'll go on a whole rant. Anyway, all right. Well, let's see. So that's about it for cheese. Right? That, that is kind of your deep dive into cheese things. And so those wine and cheese similarities are there. Um, come to one of the cheese shows. We'll talk about flavor pairing and all that sort of thing about matching intensities and doing all the all the legwork to make uh, your, your cheese and wine really soar together. And uh, we'll show you even more. We learn all those lessons together. So, all right. Well, next up, the grocery store grab. 
Oh, it's time. So uh, today, uh, we'll say for those of you not familiar with the grocery store grab, this is our uh, attempt to help get the best value per dollar for wines not found at specialty or big box retailers. So uh, could be your grocery store, might be your local, might be your local small liquor store as well. But these places, you tend to see inflated wine prices and a lot of variety, and we want to make sure that we're getting the best value. And we're approaching this from the position of non-experts. If you are just an average wine buyer who doesn't necessarily know a lot about wine, uh, I am a big advocate for strong wine labeling. So we, I, I choose these uh, at the moment uh, of, of shopping. I don't know. I don't do any prior research. I don't go out and select some um, unless there's a very specific purpose. They're basically chosen at random when I go to the grocery store and I look at, I, I let the label do the interesting part for me. And then I check out and find out how good they did on their labeling job. So uh, today's festive choice. Now, by the way, this label picture is wrong because I couldn't get a good label picture of the red blend, but the labels are identical, save for the name. Uh, but this is the Firefly Ridge uh, Red Blend, and it's a California rather than a Central Coast. But their labels mostly look like this, um, attractive, very simplistic, uh, artistic style. And again, they give their front of the label the usual treatment. Who they are, roughly where the wine is from, a vintage year, and the type of wine that it is. In this case, there's the, the red blend says so very prominently on the label instead of Pinot Noir. But uh, when I was doing the research for this, when I was doing research, meaning the I was looking at it on the grocery store uh, shelf, then comes the interesting part. And that is how well did they do on the back of the label? Because red blend means a lot of things. It's very open, obviously. Uh, so there is... Uh, there, there, there's usually the opportunity for the following. There's a, always a marketing pitch speech on the back, depending on what, you know, or almost always, depending on the wine. So this is Fireflies Light Up the Night Sky, Dancing in the Darkness of Firefly Ridge. Our wines mimic this dance with flavors that light up the palate in magical harmony. Simple bliss, career, carefree days, ephemeral glow. Firefly Ridge wines capture the brilliance of simpler times. So that's all just marketing fluff. Again, it's meant to be emotionally uh, attractive to you and bring up a particular memory for them. So that's what they're trying to do with that. But the bottom of their label breaks things down in a nice, simple, and easy to read package. California red wine is the big separator. Then this is, and this we haven't seen this in a while on a label, they break down four categories, style, aroma, flavor, and body. I find that to be excellently educational for the new to the wine world because those are the words we use to describe wine. So this is good. They're tight. So the style is rich and smooth. Okay, I can I understand what those words are, but let's go past. What about the aromas? Strawberry and raspberry. Okay, I know what those things are, even if I've never had wine. Flavor: mocha and toasty oak. Cool. These are some other things I'm smelling or taste or I'm tasting in wine that are different than just it tastes like grapes. And then finally, the body rating of medium. Now, again, body's a, a little bit of an in wine word, but um, if you do at least understand that, we're talking about how mouth filling does it feel. It says it is medium. Now, they did not do uh, something that I would, would like them to do on their red blend, and that is tell me what exactly is blended into it. Uh, tell me those grapes. And the reason that I'm such an encourager of that is because if you like this wine and you like the blend that is in it, I want you to be able to find other similar styles or find other wines that connect in. It helps your wine palate grow to know what it is you're drinking. So, uh, but yes, oh yes, there, Miss Barbara, I'm, so, I'm, I'm glad to have shown the wine, the wine labels, even if it was the incorrect one. Uh, but still, I, I do a little research for that and, and using the streaming software now, it's very cool with that. I think that's much easier than trying to show the camera especially with my lighting setup where it's, you know, where I'm doing a, a reflective back. So yeah, this uh, Firefly Ridge doing doing pretty well. Uh, we, 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 do, we don't have a mix of the blend, so that's a negative, but we definitely have flavor words and descriptors that I would consider above average. So I call this, you know, a solid, solid B, right? I mean, they could definitely give me a little bit more on that. Also, they were, I said, when I did go looking for the image, this is the one part where I do have to do a little bit of research to get those images sourced 
uh, I got to go doing a little search on the internet. And, you know, I cannot avert mine eyes from the things that I see. One of the things that I actually learned, though, is that when I didn't find, uh, there's no winery listed upon here. Or rather, it says, vintage and bottled by Firefly Ridge, Livermore, and Ripon, California. So that's where they're located. But it doesn't, but they don't have a website independent of their own, a winery of their own. I found out this is because they are under a contract label to the Safeway grocery store company. So this is a wine made for Safeway to sell. That is a it, very different style of winemaking than we normally think or talk about. So this was $12.99 at list price and $7.99 at the, at the counter. Right now, which I find now, you know, especially considering it's making their own thing. I'm like, you're not actually discounting the product that you're intending to sell us by five dollars. You're saying it's worth five dollars for you to have our, our our information on your buyer's card. So I always find that kind of amusing and that there is that separation. But we talk about that a lot. Um, and while that's a new thing for me when I moved here to the Dallas area, that was fairly uncommon a few years back. I think I've seen it come up more and more and more. But because grocery stores and uh, you know any type of loyalty card is really just you know it's not about the discounts it's about getting your good information on what you purchase the very interesting thing with that price differential i think here in north texas is often because when i first moved to this part of, te of, te of texas you couldn't buy wine in certain parts of it plano had just gone what we call damp in the area from the old prohibition eras you had just started being able to buy beer and wine and because the lobbyists worked so very hard to get that done the grocery stores who were moving into that sector for a potential open up of a market and a revenue stream were very careful to make sure that you were incentivized to tell them how much wine you were buying so more than just their inventory of us they want to know who's buying what so I always find that uh, that little faux discount to be kind of telling. But this is in the $10 price range. This is what we're expecting out of this. It's a 10 buck red blend. Awesome. That's that's exactly what I was in the mode for. These wines tend to be very approachable, easy. They're very popular right now. We're going to do a whole show on blends and blending uh, in the first week of December. So we're going to touch back on the subject a lot and about what each thing brings to the table. I couldn't use this wine because it doesn't tell us, but... You, you follow my drift. We're probably going to do some of the classics, like, say, Chateau of the Pop or maybe the Bordeaux, but we'll also go into modern red blending and just kind of the, you know, the true concept of, you know, of meritage or cuvee and how winemakers get a free run to do their own thing. So let's see how this one tastes. Let's get to that that, that space, of course. Um, we don't, you know, I'm going to do a kind of a, a shortened version of the tasting concept, but really I, I try and only come out with three pieces of the tasting notes. That is, is it a well-executed wine? Is it made well? Uh, is it on style, if, it's, if, if there is such a thing? And is it worth the price tag that we paid for it? In other words, would I purchase this again? Um, so let's take a look at color-wise. Very, uh, very purple uh, and almost, uh, it's got the kind of a, so it doesn't really have, it's, yeah, it's definitely on the purple side rather than the garnet side. So I'm betting that there's a reasonable amount of either Petit Syrah, Petit Verdot, or Zinfandel going, going into their blend. Um, it's California label, by the way, leaves us wide open to interpretation. Because that means they may be sourcing grapes from anywhere from the Central Valley to the Southern Valleys to the North Coast. It, it could be anywhere. And which literally opens up several dozen types of possible grapes. Okay, um, I'm going to swirl this around here a bit and take a smell. Yeah, I think that they're raspberry strawberry notes. The red fruit notes kind of pop here. So whatever they're all also using in there, I'm going to guess that maybe they've got, you know, what is it they're lightening up with? Possibly a little bit of Merlot, something like that would be my guess. Something on the lighter fruit scale uh, as opposed to just things like that you can definitely smell it comes across to it said the, the wine doesn't have a big heady uh strong aroma it's very light uh, so but i can see the strawberry raspberry thing possibly and uh, a little bit there's a little hint of that cinnamon uh, or slash uh toastiness of oak already already there whoa there's a, there's a shift there, though. Boy, oh, boy. 
Um, uh, it's got that odd level of um, kind of cloying sugariness. It's not sweet, but it's got this pop that turns the, the, the taste almost candied rather than uh, rather than say fresh squeezed fresh squeezed or fresh fruit versus say uh, dis or a reduced slash um, you think about say like cooked or uh, jammed fruits this instead goes the kind of the opposite direction almost like it's got that candyfied pop to it it is odd and and, and unfortunately, what I would kind of call a hallmark of inexpensive or, or muck, muck, mucked with wine. Um, it's all around the outside. There's still a tiny hint of acidity, which is nice. It makes your mouth water, which I think that's where you get that little chemical or fake or faux uh, fruit pop going on. On the flip side, this it, it is cert its body being medium, that's dead on because the center of your mouth is really hollow. There's not a lot going on with your tongue. All the flavor kind of sticks to where the, the medium tannins are. So it doesn't have a big grip. It grips you really quick. It delivers some flavor and then it's gone, right? It's this hollow feeling. And so it almost has that less than natural uh, you know, kind of thing going on. Now, I don't know about the production methods. I cannot say, but my guesses here are that they, you know, they have anything that they've done to keep this wine in this price range that they're looking at you know, some of those corner cutting methodologies that, that I'm not a big fan of or that we look for in quality wine. So, um, again, it just doesn't have the oomph to get there. Now, I am betting that they're stylistically aiming at very much that. They want people who want, for, for lack of a better word, light red wine. Um, unfortunately, the American tastes don't really run to some of those for, for, a, for some reason. And it's hard to find california styles that match anything like say the gamays from beaujolais right which are these or even barbera from from italy you know these they these wines tend you know they're rather wines in california tend to run a little bit bolder than that even when they're on the lighter side right things like pinot noirs so even for pinot noirs for instance our, our pinot noirs are one of the heavier styles of pinot noirs in california as opposed to even Oregon or then back in Burgundy or New Zealand. So same thing with this red blend. Whatever they're whatever they're aiming at is definitely the high, the lighter end of the scale to get those approachable folks. Um, those those new to wine and early to wine. And at the price tag they're aiming at, if they're asking for, you know, eight dollars for a bottle, eh, that's that's kind of what I think they're aiming for. So is it worth the price tag? Um, this is where I could probably say that if you've got four more bucks to spare, right, this is, you know, and this is not one of those big economic questions. This is, look, just spend the 15 bucks and get a, 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 I can recommend you a dozen quality examples of a red wine that you'll find more satisfying. Um, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go down this path. This is not one of those fortunate few that sits under $10 that I would call totally worth it. Um, it's not bad. I mean, it's totally, it, the good news is it's not awful. It is not a, it's not an off-putting wine in any way, but does it meet the criteria of, is it worth the price tag? Eh, I wouldn't go so far. I probably wouldn't purchase this again on purpose to say, oh man, you should try Firefly. Whereas there are several things that are under the 10 mark that I could easily recommend. So, well, Firefly Ridge, you've done a credible job, but this also, uh, again, it speaks, now that I know that, ac that accidental origin story, I think that kind of shows, and I, I, I you know, try not to let it taint my judgment, but through the taste test and not reading anything else about that, it definitely doesn't have that handmade, I be, you know, look, I made this kind of feel. And when we talk about it, it's, it's definitely in that industrial cheese class, right? There's a lot to be said for, uh, well, a lot to be said for having somebody who cares about the product at every step of the way, as opposed to fill me an order for 40,000 cases of wine, because I'm going to sell them. So different, different approach to the problem.
So anyway, um, so that is the grocery store grab. It looks like we're having trouble with the stream. My, my face is getting a little turny, turny, turny thing, even though it says excellent connection. It's that weird delay, delay that we're worried about here in the world of wine shark. So, uh, so that's, uh, so that's the grocery store grab. Well, I said, definitely, uh, I'm not going to say go rush out and try it, but now you've learned, but, uh, if you guys have any questions, I said I don't see a ton of people on hanging out, so I'm not expecting any of those. But uh, let's talk about coming soon. What's next? Um, so Friday for the online show, we have the Holiday Entertaining with Wine show. We're going to talk about hosting parties or hosting events where wine is part of your education, or part of your entertainment package, part of your education. Yeah, you must educate your guests. No, I mean, just for entertaining purposes, how to get the best bang for your buck. Uh, how to get good variety out of the least number of bottles. Um, we're also just going to talk about party planning. Hey, how many guests do you have? How many of them are, are wine drinkers? And how to buy, how much should I buy? Great example over there. If you've got a party of 40 people, how much wine should you buy? And what types? And we're going to talk about things like that. We're also just going to talk about crowd pleaser favorites. Some Drink some examples of those. These are going to be just wines that kind of cross all borders that do also so awesome things for everywhere from amateur you know i only like sweet type wines to so you know your full-on wine snobs that everywhere in between we're going to pick some wines that just straddle that fence and go hey let's all come together and have awesome wine so that's cool then saturday night reunion tower downtown dallas we're doing the same thing but bigger we're doing it 500 feet in the air and we're doing it with five different wines instead of just three there will be light snacks at the show, but you should either arrive having eaten or plan on being a late night eater. One of the two things. Uh, it's not going to be a meal and there's not going to be, there's no restaurant, etc. This is just an event provided for us. So I am hosting. The event providers are setting everything else up. It is awesome. So events with Amy is being awesome and letting us get in this space. It's going to be great. So they're going to be doing five, well, they said five wines, fruit, cheese tray. For those of you that have been to my uh, my wine tastings at the Renaissance Festival, very similar setup. Uh, and dress is casual. I'm going to be wearing a button-up shirt and some jeans. You know, don't. It's not a it's not a fine dining out experience this time. We'll get there. Um, we've also got some shows upcoming that we're starting to plan in December, January, and February. So if you're going to miss this one, not a big deal. We're going to do it again. So uh, then finally for the last show of this month will be the following Wednesday, or the following Friday, and Bacchus comes to Thanksgiving. We have Thanksgiving-focused shows and wines to go with your turkey and relatives and such. So uh, that's going to be a fun show. We'll, we'll talk about family traditions and things like that. So that'll be a lot of, that'll be kind of cool. There won't be a Wine Shark Wednesday that week. I'm taking the week off. So the next week will be no shows at all, and then we'll pick back up in December. So lots of fun stuff coming up on the horizon. Yeah, so I see that you guys are having a hard time and losing feed. Yeah, so sorry to hear that. And again, the good news is the recording will be available on YouTube. That's how we're awesome. So with that being said, um, let me know your comments. Uh, tell me about your experiences with cheese, um, especially if you've had funny, funky, cat, funky milks styles of cheese, whether you've got a favorite creamery uh, or can recommend something that's easily available for the rest of us. Those type of, uh, of uh, op options are always welcome. Um, if you like what we're doing, like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, share with a wine-loving friend, uh, especially or a cheese-loving friend in this case. And if you really like what you're doing, you can support us over on Patreon. There's exclusive content available there. All the recordings from every show, not the ones on YouTube, but the actual private online tastings are all available there. There's a lot of content coming around. So I hope you guys would appreciate that. And until next time, I have been your host. I have been your wine shark. Cheese. Ah, so good, man. I tell you. Get paid to do this? Are you kidding me? What a great job.